Frankenstein is back to cause more undead medical mayhem, but this time has he gone too far? Hi guys, so this one came out in 1969 and would again see Peter Cushing teaming up with Terence Fisher in the director's chair. It is meant to be a continuation of the previous films, I think, but Frankenstein Created Woman is not directly referenced. It's simply a case that Frankenstein himself is in the wind at the beginning of this, free to do more of his evil experiments. This time he's in a city, which gives this film a slightly different feel to the ones that have come before it. The fact that we're in a city doesn't really play into the plot, but once you've seen the early scenes on the cobblestones, you can't then get it out of your head that we are in a city. So this time the Baron takes over a hotel. He blackmails the hotel owner and her fiance into letting him use the hotel exclusively for what he wants to do. He's got some information over these people. So for the rest of the film, the Baron sets about doing his latest experiment, which basically this time involves a brain transplant and all the time he's got the law hot on his heels. So storyline wise, what we've got is a slight variation on the Frankenstein films that we've had before. The difference this time though is that in, in terms of tone we're going back more to what the first two films did, Curse and Revenge, which is not a bad thing because in my opinion those first two films are absolutely the benchmark that all the Frankenstein films to follow have to sort of try and live up to. The third and the fourth films are good in their own way but they, they did feel a little bit lighter on the horror compared to the first two. In the third film Frankenstein's running around with his merry band of friends and there's quite a bit of humour in there and you can root for the Baron in that film without actually feeling guilty about it. In the fourth film, Frankenstein is almost a periphery character in his own movie, but this time around, they've really tried to go back to showing just how evil this guy is. And this one could almost follow on from The Revenge of Frankenstein if you were of a mind to sort of disregard the third and the fourth films. And if you think about it, the second film, Revenge, it does end with Frankenstein in a city, I think it might be London or it, possibly it's an unspecified place, but and then this film starts in a city, so this one could almost have followed on from the first two films if you're willing to disregard those middle ones, but personally I, I just consider them all to be of the same canon. Right from the start of this film though you can see that Frankenstein as a character has, has really changed from what we saw before because instantly we see him weapons in hand actually killing somebody which has never really happened before. I mean in the first film he does kill a maid but he does that indirectly. He shoves her into a room and lets his monster do the dirty work for him and doubtless throughout the, the, the movies there are other examples of, of where he's been completely despicable but this is the first time I can remember him weapons in hand acting like some kind of Jason Voorhees knockoff cutting somebody's head off with a scythe in this instance. But I don't think it's going against the character because if we assume all the films to be canon then by this point of his life, by the fifth film, you've got to think that he's probably been very frustrated by the way things have gone for him over the previous few years. He's had lots of safe houses and bases where he's tried to get on with his work, but something's always gone wrong. He's always been hounded out of whichever town he was working in. And by this point, if we assume the character to be the, the same age as Peter Cushing, roughly, then he's in his late 50s now. He's presumably a little bit worried that time is going to be running out for him soon and he still hasn't quite conquered what he wants to do. He still hasn't managed to get to a point where he can share with the rest of the world what he's done and, and the value of it. So when we get to the start of this film, I could just about believe that he would be frustrated enough with what's happened previously that he would now want to speed up the process of the, these experiments, not want to crawl around graveyards at the dead of night looking for cadavers and spending hours and hours of it. Okay, fine, maybe he now wants to just go out, be really quick about it, kill somebody in 10 minutes flat and, and proceed onwards. So the murdering part of the Baron that we get at the start of this film, I don't have a problem with. Raping Veronica Carlson, that's a little bit harder to defend, sadly. Prior to this film, Frankenstein hadn't shown any interest in the opposite sex since the very first one, The Curse of Frankenstein. In that film he had a maid on the go, he had his fiancée, so two women at the same time. Reading between the lines, it's easy to think that this guy in his younger adult life was a little bit of a player, but then during the first film his true calling came along and that led him to slowly caring less and less about women. 
to the point where we get to the second film, and Bond girl Eunice Gason walks right in front of his nose and doesn't even blink. And then we get to this, the fifth film, and suddenly he walks past the bedroom of Anna, played by Veronica Carlson, and, and thinks to himself, oh, she's attractive. I, I haven't thought about a woman in years, but wow, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd quite like a piece of her. And he, he just decides to go and rape her. It's a little bit out of the blue for me. I don't have a problem with rape scenes being in movies if they're justified for the story or a certain character. But in this instance, it's just too far out of left field. If they had to include this scene, I think what they should have done is set it up a little bit better with, with something that happens earlier on in the story. So maybe Frankenstein could have tried it on with Anna earlier in a more polite way, but being rebuffed. And maybe that could have led to Frankenstein thinking, oh, wow, this didn't used to happen to me when I was younger. Women used to fall for me. What the hell is going on? And then after thinking about it, he would then realize, oh, wow, I'm, I'm actually getting on in years a little bit here. This is a little bit depressing. And that then would have led to him just raping Anna later on. This could have also tied into what I was saying earlier about Frankenstein deciding to kill people now because it speeds up the process a little bit. He, he's worried about taking up too much time when he doesn't have an awful lot of years left. So there could have been a theme in this movie of aging and being worried about heading towards being an old person, not achieving what you want to, being depressed that you can't pick up women anymore when you used to be able to do that. But sadly, the film doesn't quite realise the potential in that idea. Certainly the rape scene is a surprise, but, but it's also the, the worst scene in the movie. It's not quite justified. The film does have lots of other really good surprises, though, like when the Baron actually kills Anna. That is a really surprising scene, really brutal, easily believable, though, given the murder that the Baron commits right at the beginning. And, and that scene in, in and of itself is a big surprise because initially you do think that it is one of Frankenstein's monstrous creations that's doing the killing and then he pulls the mask off and it turns out to be the Baron. It's quite a funny little joke that because presumably the writers or writer is thinking along the lines of okay you were expecting it to be a monster but it's actually a human being a bit like the overall series you think you're going to get something that's similar to what Universal did what you're getting is an entirely different monster altogether. The, the title of the film itself definitely really pushes you towards thinking about Baron Frankenstein being an actual monster now. He's gone down this path of rape and murder. Remember, you don't really kill, uh, you don't destroy human beings, you, you kill them. Things that you destroy are more, you know, animals and creatures and things. So the, the title for me is absolutely saying Frankenstein is a monster and possibly he's gone past the point now where He's, we're ever going to bring him back, you know, all, all that's left to do now is to finish this series off and, and see his downfall. Despite how despicable he is, though, Frankenstein still has his razor sharp wit. I, I think that's one of the main reasons why I keep coming back to this character, why I keep coming back to these films. The retorts that he comes out with to other characters throughout all of the movies, not just this one. I, I just absolutely lo love them. There's a great scene in this where Frankenstein walks into a common room wearing this absolutely outrageous pink dressing gown thing. Cracks me up every time I see it. There are these four snooty middle-aged men in there who are talking about Frankenstein, but they don't recognise him when he walks among them. So Frankenstein just sits there and listens to these guys talking about him. And you'd think the Baron would just be relieved that they haven't recognised him. But in the end, he just he just has to stand up and say something. He, he he just can't resist, and the put downs that he gives to these guys, it's just fantastic. I mean, it's just it's one of him against four of them, and he absolutely destroys them. There's another scene later on that I like as well when he he orders Anna to go and make coffee because she's completely under his thumb by this point, and the fi the fiance chimes in. He he says, "Oh, come on, just let the girl go. You don't need her." And Frankenstein just calmly re retorts, I need her to make coffee. Just absolutely brilliant. I think another downside of this film is possibly the fact that there's not much in the way of science lab creature experimentation. So that was one of the big things I loved about The Curse of Frankenstein. You know, you got to see the Baron moving around all this science equipment, spinny wheels and electro coils and things. And part of the fun was seeing whether what he was doing would work or not. And he had his creature in like a flotation tank and... You don't really get that in this film, and from what I can recall, even in the previous film, Frankenstein Created Woman, it was all glossed over a little bit. I mean, we're not even dealing with a creature this time around, it's just basically a bloke. 
getting a brain transplant and coming back to life and he doesn't really resemble what you would think of as a monster or a creature at all. The main focus point of this film instead is more Frankenstein trying to stay ahead of the authorities and this does lead to some very high tension scenes like when, when he has to get this, um, this doctor out of an asylum and there's this crazy woman shouting about spiders, drawing the, the, the police to the scene. There's a great moment where a, a geezer suddenly comes out of a grave and that gave me a little bit of a start. I, I think it's pretty cool how they set that up and Anna actually deals with that situation very well. In terms of the ending, I think they had the right idea, you know, um, so they set it up so that Frankenstein is probably going to burn to death at the hands of his own creation. But they, they fudge it a little bit because they weren't quite sure if they were going to do any more films with Cushing as Frankenstein. So they don't actually show Frankenstein on fire. You know, it's a little bit like the ending of 2018 Halloween. Because at the time they did that film, they didn't know that they were going to go on and do Halloween Kills and Ends. So they, were, they wanted to burn Michael to death, have the definitive ending, but not quite sure. So they deliberately didn't actually show, you know, Michael on fire. So in this, what you basically see is Frankenstein being carried into the flames, but uh, but the credits come on ultra fast. This happens a lot in older films anyway. I mean, I, I kind of feel like sometimes these older films might as well just roll the credits along the bottom of the screen while the third act is still playing. I mean, if they're absolutely desperate to get a film over and done with quickly, then why not? Time to show you the version of the film that I've got for this. Here is my Blu-ray copy of Frankenstein must be destroyed. It's a very flimsy box, it must be said. It feels like my fingers could almost push through it as if it's like paper mache or something. I've actually got a Dracula film which is in a very similar box. I think it might be Dracula Rises for the, from the Grave, but I'm not sure. There's no features on this, it's literally a bare bones release which is kind of a shame. I've got some really good editions of other Frankenstein films, so The Curse of Frankenstein Revenge of Frankenstein and Frankenstein and the Monster from Hell. Those three, I've got some really good editions of those, like multiple discs, lots of features and stuff like that. It'd be great if there was something like that for this. But sadly, at the moment, this is all we have, at, at least in this region. I'm not, not sure about other regions, but there we have it. Let's get to the Bag of Terror and find out how I'm going to score this film. So we've got one, two, three... Four bloody axes out of five. This is another excellent entry in Hammer's Frankenstein series. And for me, possibly the best since The Revenge of Frankenstein. It's very close between Revenge of Frankenstein and this one, I'd say. Although nothing will come close, I think, to the original film, The, the Curse of Frankenstein. Right, so that's all for today. I'll be back soon to do uh, another Hammer film. Until next time, cheerio, bye-bye.